Paul. Um, okay, so uh, so just a quick run through of uh, just our project outcomes and, and what's been happening since. And um, uh, I'll, I'll do this quickly so we can have time for either questions or gawping at the monument out of the window. Um, so I don't know whether you can read this. Uh, no. <laughs> no, okay. no, I wasn't going to read it, but I'll read it really quickly. Um, okay, so the Whitehall archives being catalogued, more accessible, up to modern museum standards. Uh, we had various apps and digital presence as well uh, through the museum. Um, material, uh, the Whitehall collection since the 1930s had spread across many different museums and been gifted all over the place. We managed to recover some of those things and bring them back to, to Brighton. Um, uh, the White Hawk Archive's been uh, specially assessed. Uh, we've made significant improvements to the, uh, the monument, as Paul uh, said out there. We've got to, uh, to, I'll come on to the report in a minute. Um, 136 people volunteered on the project. That's, you know, it's, it's a huge number of people, really. We had, like I said before, about 60 unskilled archaeologists on, on the excavation. The only reason that we could do that is that we had uh, skilled volunteers from Brighton and Hove Archaeological Society supporting us in that role. It was just me and, uh, and a, another colleague of mine, Liz, uh, from ASC, who, who run that, um, that volunteer dig. So, you know, without the uh, Brighton and Hove Archaeological Society, we wouldn't be able to do that. Uh, likewise, I, I wasn't involved in any of the site improvement works. That was Paul and Paul's team. And again, you you must have had about 30, 40 people at least on on the site the, the site improvement works. All in all, we had about over fifty actually. Yeah, over 50. Different, different groups coming in. Yeah. In in the end, so uh, I mean, our partnership with with uh, Brighton Hope Archaeological Society and, and City Parks really really allowed that to happen. Um, Seventy percent of our volunteers had never been involved in a heritage project before. Uh, 88% were from the Brighton area. Um, uh, you know, we really tried, and this was Hillary's work as well, to encourage volunteers from the local community. And, and we, we went to schools down in, in Whitehawk and surrounding areas, we went to festivals down there. We, we tried as much as we could to involve uh, the local population. Um, again, I'll come to the uh, open day at the museum in a bit. Um, so our outreach program to schools and colleges, community centres, um, and we engaged about seven, eight hundred people through that. Um, uh, I think uh, John said as well, but uh, Brighton Hope Archaeological Society after this also started uh, conducting uh, more engagement, going to schools, and making school visits and things of that nature. Um, so, uh, and we've also supported, the project also supported other community initiatives in their grant applications. Um, and, and basically, we, we still, we, it's difficult to maintain these things after a project finishes, but we, but we are maintaining sort of like relationships with numerous Brighton wide groups, the museum, Brighton Hope Archaeological Society, the Rangers, and, and we want to keep those uh, uh, relationships going. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, Brighton Museum can be here today, but uh, Andy Maxted, who was the curator who was involved most in the project, and uh, his line manager, uh, Richard Lasso, uh, asked me to say a, a, few, a few words on their behalf. But um, we had a family archaeology day at Brighton Museum, um, and the attendance for that was about 1,800 people. The normal footfall for the museum on that day, I understand, was about three, 400. So we attracted, uh, you know, over a thousand additional uh, uh, visitors to the museum uh, that day. And um, I think that's really important, especially for a museum like Brighton's, because Brighton Museum is a museum and art gallery. It's situated in the centre of Brighton. It's got lots of compete competing uh, things going on for its, for its space. It's not just a museum about, uh, about archaeology. And, and the open day there, as well as the project itself, I think, showed Brighton Museum that there is an appetite for uh, for local archaeology, that they have got important collections, and they can sort of like display, if they display these things in, a, in an interesting and engaging way, then they will get a footfall. Um, so an important part from our point of view was to make sure that the reassessment of that archive that hadn't been looked at properly since the 20s and 30s, um, apart from a dating programme undertaken by uh, uh, English Heritage through the Gathering Time project with Alistair Whittle as well. Um, 
So we created uh, our post-excavation assessment report, which details all of the finds uh, assessment and the other work that we, we did in the field that's available as a PDF. It's, it's online on our website. If you can't find it, come find me afterwards and I can, I can show you how to get a copy. Um, and, uh, and after the event, I also uh, uh, produced a, an article with uh, contributions from the, from the specialists as well. And, uh, and publish that in, in SAC so we could um, we could get that out there. Um, so other things that are, are, are continuing from this. So the museum, uh, to get back to the museum. So the open day evidenced the museum that uh, that local archaeology could like drive visitor attendance. Um, the, the other thing that the museum has uh, said to me, and, and, and Brighton Hope Archaeological Society are involved in this as well, that they've maintained about uh, 12 or 13 volunteers since the end of the project, many of them Brighton Hope Archaeological Society members. And they've carried on doing this recataloguing and repackaging for many other aspects of, of their archives there. Um, and, and as John alluded to, there's been additional lobbying to Brighton Museum, and they've got what sounds to be a really exciting archaeology uh, gallery going to be opening in the autumn with uh, I can't I can't tell you too much about it but uh, looking at Brighton residents through the millennia basically and it, it would be well worth a, a visit the archive from Whitehall camp is really important it's been worked on as part of the gathering time project uh, provided one of the best dated causeway enclosures within that project since we uh, uh, reassessed and improved that archive, we also started talking to other colleagues in other organisations and making them aware that now this archive was more accessible and, um, and available for use. This has led to um, the museum uh, assisting the Natural History Museum, UCL, Manchester Uni, Durham Uni, Winchester Uni, all in studying the White Hawk archive. That's important for the museum as well because <coughs> it shows the, uh, the museum that their archives and collections are being used um, used properly and that's, the, that's an important thing for them too. Um, the other amazing thing is that uh, like well, Paul's, when, when a project like I say end, ends like us then you can all of a sudden very quickly disappear. We've all been engaged in it for a long time as individuals but it's Brighton Hove Archaeological Society and, importantly, uh, City Park and Paul as a ranger who maintains that, that link. I mean, and, and Paul is continuing with site improvements uh, on the site. I've, uh, I've spoken to him after the end of the project in the installation of the chestnut pale fencing and things in order to facilitate the, uh, the sheep grazing better. Um, as I mentioned before, we also sponsored other sort of like community projects. This is uh, a film that was undertaken by the Red Earth uh, Environmental Arts Group uh, called Whitehawk Hill. I don't think it's available yet. It is, so is it? Yeah. <coughs> installation. Installation. Film installation. But, uh, but <coughs> again, maybe if you ask Matt, he might tell you what the link of that is. Um, through uh, the project as well, we uh, became engaged more with Brighton Hope City Council and as Paul uh, said as well, the biosphere, UNESCO biosphere, which we're in at the moment, which links human activity to uh, uh, ecosystems and, um, and what interaction uh, occurs between the two. So we became a partner within the uh, UNESCO uh, biosphere um, and we were also uh, invited to take part in the research and monitoring strategy and helping to form that. And, um, and through that process we uh, hopefully have influenced that in a good way and now one of the research aims uh, states about cultural heritage and natural heritage and, and looking at the interaction between sort of human populations and, um, and, and the ecosystem, and ecosystems over time and hopefully we'll be able to apply for more funding and, and carry on in, in that vein. Um, and, and just to say at the end we were a uh, we received highly commended award from the from the uh, uh, oh, from the CBA, the March Award at the end of the project. So I just thought I'd better stick that up at the end just to show you all. 
and, that, and, and that's that's me. So I'm sure Dominic will now chair if you have any questions, and if not, we can have a look at them.